Hello everyone, and welcome to our mathematics reading group. If you're seeing this, then you know that our goal is to read the text Categories and Sheaves by Kashiwara and Shapira. This project is a bit of an undertaking, and those without tremendous exposure to sheaves and cohomology in the various classical settings that geometry and topology furnish us with may find it to be a bit of an opaque subject. The purpose of these videos is to help offer some of that context, as well as to cl uh, clarify arguments that Kashiwara and Shapira may leave to the reader, or otherwise too terse to unpack on a first reading. My partner and I intend to follow the book as closely as we can, allowing for excursions into the other areas of math where, uh, when the material naturally finds itself at home there. We don't intend to re-give every single definition and reprove every proposition. Our goal is to make the theory as enlightening as possible, rather than to just read the viewer their book. As such, we might skip some definitions or propositions and circle back to them when we need them, if it makes things flow smoothly now. Section 1.1 of categories and sheaves should be regarded as a technical section. Every introduction to category theory will have to start out with some words about what a category is, and this invariably involves some set theory. The purpose of this section is to give us a useful way of dealing with sets as they appear in category theory. Growth and deep universes are the main tool for eliminating these types of problems, and are probably new to most readers. You should think of a growth and deep universe as a context for doing set theory, like a totality of sets, hence the name universe. The axiom of universes given in the text essentially tells us that whenever we're handed an object that we'd like to call a set or would like to call itself a set, then there's some growth in deep universe in which it resides where you can call it a set. This has some interesting set theoretic implications, but as far as additional axioms to set theory go, it's rather weak, and as such we don't really want to belabor the point. It allows us to stack layers of largeness within the context of set theory. If I have a set and I want to do some construction on that set that I worry might make me leave this universe. Well, as long as my construction is relatively tame, then I can just find some new universe where I can work in. It is possible to leave the realm of growth and deep universes, and this will happen later in the chapter. We'll point it out when it does, but for the, the most part, growth and deep universes give us a tool to sort of eliminate these annoying technicalities. They don't really cause all that many headaches or introduce new problems. So for the minor price of constantly needing to refer to some growth and deep universe U, which will often just suppress reference to anyway, we can stop thinking about whether or not some large object is actually a set in the overwhelming majority of cases. With that said, let's go on to the, the beginning of the actual content of the book, which is section 1.2, and they introduce the notion of categories. We expect that most of our readers are familiar with the basic ideas of categories, so we'll just sort of make the definitions that we need for kind of completeness sake and for the sake of recording the various notations we'll need, but I think most viewers will hopefully have already seen these basic ideas. So a category for us consists of the following data. First, it's a set of objects, which we just denote by ob. A set of morphisms between every pair of objects, which we'll denote by either HOM C, or maybe sometimes we'll call it CXY if this notation is convenient to us, and a composition rule. Which should be thought of as a function from HOM XY cross hum yz to hum xz. And we subject these things to a couple of constraints. Of course, we require there to always be the identity map. So in other words, for any x, hum xx is never empty. And also, we require that the composition rule be associative. And I'm not going to try to write out exactly what this means purely formally. Um, I think our intuitive idea of function composition being associative will suffice. In other words, if I think of this function composition as just the usual composition with a little you know, circle notation, um, then all I'm saying here is f compose g compose h should be the same thing as f compose g compose h with the parentheses in the other order. Otherwise, we don't make further restrictions. We don't require other HOM sets to be non-empty. And in particular, um, we ha 
had this uh, minor hiccup here, maybe that some people would not expect here, where we call these guys sets. And this is sort of the point of growth and deke universes. Um, this set here resides in some growth and deke universe, and it makes our category uh, have a set of objects rather than what some uh, people with past experience might have called a class of objects. As such, this, we have this kind of liberty to just name things as sets. We expect that most viewers will have seen many examples of categories. But just as a quick reminder, well, most objects fit this bill. Algebraic objects, for example, form categories. We have groups, rings, fields, vector spaces, among others, where the objects are, well, whatever the things I just said are, and the morphisms are the suitable homomorphisms of the various types, group homomorphisms, ring homomorphisms, uh, linear transformations, and such. There are also examples coming from topology, things like topological spaces, where the morphisms are continuous maps, as well as things like smooth manifolds, where the morphisms are the uh, not just the continuous maps as manifolds but the smooth maps and in general you can make categories out of most respectable mathematical objects where one wants to compose the morphisms between the objects in the same vein as this set theoretic definition we uh, can talk about the size of our categories and the first thing that we do is sort of fence off those categories that are reasonably small, no pun intended. And so we'll call a category u locally small, where u is a growth and universe that we've kind of fixed. If hom in c x y is a set in u. And similarly, we call it simply u small. If the objects of C are set in U. So of course, some categories that are going to be u small are not going to be v small for some other category or for some other growth in the universe v. So our notion of smallness here is now tied down to a growth and universe. This is a pretty small price to pay since most of the time we won't really be thinking of the growth and universe. It won't be occupying any central space in our mind, but it is worth uh, pointing out that we do need to kind of not completely forget it. With this in mind, we want to introduce the first and most important principle in category theory which will come up over and over and over again, which is our principle of duality. And this is done by constructing the opposite category of a given category. So if C is a category, then we denote by C op with superscript op the following category constructed out of C. The objects of C op are equal to the objects of C. And the morphisms between any pair of objects, these are objects in C, will simply be the morphisms in the original category that go in the reverse direction. So a morphism from X to Y in the opposite category is a morphism from Y to X in the original category. And this sort of thing turns out to be extremely useful. It gives us a way to uh, take any theorem we prove involving, say, commutative diagrams or just messes of arrows between objects and formulate another theorem where all the arrows go backwards that lives in the opposite category. And we would note, make this uh, a definition out of uh, that corresponds to any given definition where the arrows are reversed called the dual notion or the dual definition. And whenever we prove a theorem in a category, we'll be able to reverse all the arrows and prove the same theorem with the dual notions in the opposite category, allowing us to prove two theorems at once. 
While this might look a little bit contrived or maybe even artificial at first, we promise you it's not. To illustrate, let's give the first and most basic example of duality in practice. So we'll introduce one more definition for the moment. There will be plenty more definitions to come. We call two morphisms, maybe we'll denote them by F and G, from X to Y, are parallel when, well, I kind of drew it to give you an idea of what it means, when they have the same domain and codomain, or the same source and target object in whatever the category is that we're working in. And this lets us make the definition of a monomorphism and an epimorphism. We'll call them a morphism F is a monomorphism, or just a mono for short, if it has the following property. For every pair of morphisms, every pair of parallel morphisms, G1 and G2, say from Z to X, where Z is just some other object, we have F composed with G1 equals F composed with G2 implies g1 equals g2. In other words, we're saying that f is left cancelable. This can be formulated with a very simple diagram that shows the, the cancellation. We have our pair of parallel maps, z to x, g1, and g2, and our f x to y. And with this drawing, we can make the dual definition easily. All we'll do, I'll label it just to be clear, maybe I'll call it dually. We can just flip all the arrows around. Y, we'll now have a map f from y to x, and our pair of maps run out of x and into z. And the corresponding definition is of an epimorphism, or just an epi for short. And we get that these should be right cancelable instead of left cancelable. So if you've never seen these definitions before, then in the category of sets, then we're already quite familiar with these. In sets, the monomorphisms are simply the injective functions. And the epis, well, easy enough to guess, these are the surjective functions. And that these are related by duality is maybe the nice first little feature of category theory, that we have uh, this natural pair of notions which are related to each other by these simple dual diagrams. And in a general category, we're not going to be able to make such nice statements. Like if I'm handed some random category, I'm not going to have a very simple characterization of what the monos are in that category. Sometimes when the categories uh, have objects, which can be thought of as sets with additional structure, you can say some nice things, like in some familiar algebraic categories you'll be able to make some statements. But even then, it isn't always true that a mono has to be an, an injection, an epi has to be a surjection. The relationship between monos and injections, and epis and surjections in general, uh, can be imported from the set theory, but we need to formulate it as a, a little differently. And we do so with the following proposition. So let's say we have a morphism in some category f x to y. This will be a mono if and only if the induced map on HOM sets is an injection. And of course, we can completely formulate a dual remark and a dual proposition. Um, and so we won't have to go through the proof of that twice. And this is kind of the first example of where this principle of duality 
buys us something useful in that it lets us prove these two theorems at once. Before I go on to prove this theorem, I should maybe make one kind of clarifying remark about what I mean by the induced map. This is going to be a kind of thing we'll do in uh, these notes a lot is we don't necessarily need to spell out every single what every single map does and what every single uh, induced map does uh, when they come from a sort of natural composition. And we'll elaborate more on what natural means in the relevant section. But for now, uh, we'll spell it out. What I mean is that if I have under consideration here, hum, maybe zx, the map f lets me define a sort of induced map, which I'll denote by f circle, to hum zy, given by just composition. In other words, if I have any map z to x, maybe I call it phi, then I can then apply f, and now I have a map z to y, given by the composition, f composed with phi. And so the map here looks like phi maps to f composed with phi. That's why we kind of gave it this cheeky little uh, definition as f circle. Okay, so now let's see if we can ex explain why this theorem is true. Well, suppose we had, uh, actually, we can even do this both directions at once. You recall that the definition of an injective map is a map, maybe we'll call it capital F, such that fx equals fy implies x equals y. Well, our map capital F here is the map little f circle, and x and y here will be our pair of parallel morphisms, g1 and g2. So changing the notation, what we have here is f composed with g1 equals f composed with g2 implies g1 equals g2. And that's just the definition of a monomorphism again. And you can see that we can reverse all the steps in this explanation to go in the reverse direction. So that completes the proof. I'll draw a little black box because that seems cute. Okay, one cautionary remark is in order about this, which is that we have the notion, which many of you will hopefully be familiar with, of an isomorphism. Maybe this is both a definition and a cautionary remark. So maybe it's worth writing down. An isomorphism in a category is a morphism with an inverse morphism. Maybe I'll name it a morphism F with an inverse G. In other words, F, if I do G compose F, well then if F, say, went X to Y, then G would go back, and this would be the identity on X. And similarly, F composed G would be the identity on Y. Okay, so it's easy to check that when we're in this situation, we'll get an induced bijection on HOM sets. However, in this case, you don't have the nice if and only if. This is because there's nothing about the statements in the proposition that I just stated and proved that actually would furnish us with a map in the reverse direction that would be an inverse. So when you're in a category more complicated than set, there isn't really any reason to think that just because I have this bijection on Hums that I need to actually have this inverse. You'd have to go out of your way to construct it. Even in categories like set, you might recall that this is not completely obvious there either. Because if I have this, uh, this is the essentially Cantor-Schroeder-Bernstein theorem. Schroeder. Bernstein. And this essentially says that when I have um, uh, this uh, monomorphism going one way and again going the other way, then this actually gets you a bijection uh, of sets. And so the proof of this fact kind of requires some ping pong logic. You have to do this non trivial construction in order to actually build the inverse map. And that is a non-trivial amount of work. So even for sets, uh, it's not completely easy to see what's going on here. Okay, so with that warning out of the way, uh, let's introduce one more notion for which duality is extremely useful. And this is the notion of a universal property. 
We're not going to try to go out of our way to make precise the definition of a universal property, at least not right now. Maybe we'll come back to it later if it comes out to be useful. Um, but we will say at least what an initial and a terminal object are. And this will make precise. And it'll turn out that if you understand initial and terminal objects, then you'll actually be able to make sense of universal properties as precisely as you like later. So again, suppose we're in some category C and we have some I in the objects of C. And we'll call I initial if there's a unique map. Let me state it this way. If for any other object, Also, I'm very quickly getting tired of writing ob c all the time. Um, I'm just going to start writing x and c. Um, there is a unique map i to x. And dually, we call t and c terminal excuse me, if there is a unique map x to t. Okay, this is kind of clearly the dual definition, and we're probably familiar with examples here too. Again, in the category of sets, the initial object, well actually the initial object is a little bit difficult to figure out what it should be. The terminal object on the other hand is easy to see because we know that the number of maps from uh, x to y can be written down in terms of an exponential function. And so if I want there to be exactly one map, then I know from the formula that, uh, that there has to be exactly one element in the codomain. And so this is given by the singleton with a single point. Ha, ah, the singleton with a single point, that's redundant. Anyway, to give the initial object, well, you might recall from set theory, we have this convention uh, that 0 to the 0 is 1 in, in that world when we want to count these functions. And this is the same sort of thing. Um, you might recall that if I have a, uh, the empty set, there's actually always one function from the empty set to x, which is defined vacuously, the so-called empty map. And so the empty set will have this property, even if it's a little bit surprising uh, at first glance. Okay, so, oh yeah, one more definition. If you're in a category that has both an initial and a terminal object, uh, and the initial terminal object are equal, we'll call that the zero object. This is the case, this isn't the case in sets, because as we just said, they're different, but it is the case in a lot of other familiar categories, um, like for example, in vector spaces, uh, the trivial vector space consisting of just the zero vector over some field. Um, that's an example. There's only one linear map out because the linear maps take zero to zero. So for any other vector space, you only have that one map, but there's also only one map uh, to that space given by, again, the zero map, which just collapses everything to zero. Okay, so these objects are unique, and we'll say that as a proposition. I'll just do the initial object again by duality. I don't need to do the terminal object. So the proposition will simply read, initial objects are unique up to a unique isomorphism. Okay. And how, we go about, how do we go about proving this? Well, we just suppose, I don't think I wrote proof before. That's okay. So we'll just suppose we had two initial objects, i and j. Well, since i is initial, we have a unique map i to j. And as well, we have a unique map j to i. And I'll denote the uniqueness by an exclamation point. This is typical. Um, this is a standard notation. And now, composing these, 
this would get us a map i to j to i, also again unique, and we know that hum i to i is just the identity on i. Well, why is this? Well, we know it contains at least the identity on i, but it also consists of only the identity on i, because it's initial. And in particular, that makes these maps naturally the inverse to one another. And so they must be isomorphic. To see that this isomorphism is the only such isomorphism, well, again, we can suppose we had two such isomorphisms. So if we had isomorphisms phi psi i to j, well, then I could consider the composition, uh, say, phi following psi inverse. This would be an isomorphism i to i. Well, it could be j to j. I didn't tell you which direction these things go, but suppose it's i to i. But we just determined that the only such map is the identity. So that means that if phi composed with psi inverse is the identity on i, then clearly just multiplying by psi on the right, canceling, follows that phi is equal to psi. So the isomorphism is unique. Okay, so in all the examples that we've been thinking about so far, the categories we've been looking at are have these notions of sets with structure. And we know from our experience with math that the first thing we do when we have an object, especially when it consists of a set with some structure, is we make the notion of a sub-object, or in particular, we'll have some subset with some induced structure. This leads us to the notion of a subcategory. And so we'll make a definition. A subcategory, C prime of C, is a category where the objects of C prime are a subset of the objects of C. And we're justified in using this subset notation because, uh, again, we've kind of banished all of our set theoretic issues. So these are sets. And similarly, Hom C prime of X, Y should be a subset of Hom C of X, Y for every such pair. And lastly, we require the composition to be the induced composition. In other words, if I compose two morphisms in C prime, it should be the same as what I would get if I compose them in C. So nothing new can happen here. Subcategories come with a couple of special adjectives associated to them. We call a subcategory full. When the HOM sets are equal. So HOM C prime X, Y is actually equal to HOM C X, Y for every X, Y. Uh, and no, actually, I'm sorry, we do not, we don't, there, there is no notion of faithful subcategory, but there will be a notion of a faithful map between categories when we've gotten that far. So this is it for now. Okay, and the last thing I want to introduce for this lecture, or meeting, I guess I should call it, is that we have a sort of example of categories that are extremely in, uh, important which is, again, constructed sort of internally. And this is the category of arrows. Arrow is a sort of colloquialism for a morphism. So in this category, which is denoted by more of C, or maybe uh, air of C, if you like, I think we're gonna use it, the notion uh, more of C. That's what Kashiwara and Shapiro use. So I think we'll stick to that. Um, and in this category, the objects of the morphis of the category of morphisms are the morphisms of C. That seems like a stupid definition. Maybe I should be clear. This is the union of all the Homs. So in other words, an object is literally represented by an arrow, like so. 
And then we can ask then what is hum? And this is going to be a really verbose way to write this down. So we won't do it after this. Wow, that's really hard to read. Hopefully I don't have to adjust my handwriting too much. I apologize to everyone. So this will be the collection of morphisms A. Uh, I should be clear. The, if F is X to Y, then maybe G is, I don't know, Z to W. Then this consists of pairs of morphisms A, X to Z, and B, Y to W such that the following diagram commutes. And B is to Z. All right, this is our definition. So we could specialize this construction and we can tweak it in a bunch of different ways. One way that's really important is we might require all the morphisms to be out of one object or into one object, fixing that object. You could, in this way, obtain categories of commutative triangles instead of uh, categories where the morphisms are commutative squares. You can generalize this definition as much as you like uh, and make categories where the diagrams are whatever shape you like. Uh, but for now, we'll just content ourselves with this. And if we need any more details, we'll come back to them when we need them. So. In this first lecture, we spent some effort describing the basic object of our study and equipping ourselves with some of the most common adjectives which we would use to describe them. This is, of course, just a small fraction of those in Kashiwara and Shapira, uh, but it's a good starting place. Uh, next time, when we get together, we'll start talking about uh, functors, which are the sort of natural homomorphisms of categories and categories of functors. See you then.